All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, gives me great pleasure today to introduce one of my trusted colleagues at Northwestern, Dr. Stubi Patil. Uh, Dr. Patil is Assistant Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University. He joined our group. He's now a second year attending, so he joined our group after training at Hopkins for uh, basically everything. <laughs> so he's become an invaluable member of our group, particularly for me as we uh, cover Northwestern's Lake Forest Hospital together. He's going to be talking to us this morning about antiarrhythmic drug therapy. So thank you, Stubi, for doing this, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Nishant. Uh, that was a very kind introduction. Um, and uh, you know, I'm looking forward to giving this talk and being a part of your great collection of, of uh, talks. Um, so I'm going to talk about antiarrhythmic drugs. Admittedly, I think most of us can agree it's probably not the most exciting of topics in the world of electrophysiology, but definitely I think most would agree that it's, it is a critical topic. Uh, most often, you know, patients don't really uh, meet an electrophysiologist till the question of antiarrhythmic drug therapy comes up. That sometimes is our sort of first point of contact for a lot of our patients. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, excited to sort of go into some more detail about the drugs. Um, I'm going to focus this mostly around atrial fibrillation, given that that's the clinical scenario where we most often encounter uh, the decision about antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, so we'll talk about, for AFib, the indications for rhythm control. We'll talk about uh, the antiarrhythmic drugs and really just focus mostly on class one and class threes, which we sort of call the real antiarrhythmics. Um, and then we'll talk about typical guidelines for use for these agents, how to monitor uh, that their associated toxicities, and then whatever uh, important drug-drug interactions uh, we all should know uh, more clinically and as, as well as for the boards. Is, uh, it's a very common question that comes up. Um, so I think before we talk about the drugs, obviously, uh, some basics that we all uh, are familiar with in terms of, uh, you know, when do you start thinking about rhythm control and, and what do you address before you even get to rhythm control? So obviously for AFib, if, if that's what we're going to focus on today, you know, stroke prevention is sort of priority, priority number one. You obviously want to assess their stroke risk uh, with the chads vast score. Um, and then decide on therapeutic anticoagulation and which patients meet indications for that. Um, and then, uh, you know, when I see a patient in the clinic for AFib with that first visit, I really stress the importance of risk factor modification um, and trying to optimize everything we can from a lifestyle and uh, other sort of medical comorbidities perspective. Uh, I often tell my patients that um, everything that I can offer, whether that's antiarrhythmic medications or ablation, uh, really would not be that successful unless we've addressed these other things. So you want to make sure patients' blood pressures are well controlled, that if they have a cardiomyopathy or HFPEF, that you know, from a volume standpoint, they're uh, euvolemic and as close to that as, as possible. Um, if they're obese, obviously even a mild to moderate amount of weight loss can be very effective in rhythm control, also in, in affecting the course of sleep apnea. So almost always I refer my patients for sleep apnea testing. Um, just because it's, you know, over the years, we've, we've seen just how critical a risk factor it is for, for ongoing AFib. And, and we know that our antiarrhythmics and our ablations just are not as successful if someone's undiagnosed sleep apnea goes untreated. Uh, and then obviously alcohol is a big, big risk factor for AFib as well. So talking about that with the patients right at the beginning is, is important. Um, so three major indications for rhythm control, right? So one is obviously symptoms. So whether that's palpitations, dyspnea, lightheadedness, you know, angina, syncope, heart failure, and these things are happening despite good rate control of someone's AFib, uh, you should start thinking about maintaining sinus rhythm in that patient. Um, second indication would be if you're in a, in, uh, you know, unable to adequately control someone's heart rate, um, especially if they have a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So maybe they don't um, have, uh, you know, clinical symptoms of AFib, but if their EF is dropped and, and you can't rate control them well with standard rate control agents, that's another uh, indication for rhythm control. And then there is uh, an indication for patient preference. Some patients just have a strong preference to be in sinus rhythm instead of paroxysmal or persistent AFib. And so those patients you talk to about rhythm control as well. Um, so we'll do one slide on the action potential. Obviously, all of our antiarrhythmic drugs, you know, uh, focus on their activities on, on an ion channel somewhere that in our action potential. And so uh, you remember the phases of the action potential. Phase four is sort of our resting membrane potential, and uh, it's predominantly driven by potassium channels, the inward rectifier potassium channel. 
Um, we'll talk, I uh, focus on the class one antiarrhythmics, which, uh, you know, affect phase zero and, and our sodium channel uh, blockers or primary sodium channel blockers. And then the class threes, uh, as a class, almost all uh, inhibit or block the uh, rapid delayed re rectifying potassium current in phase three. Um, and so that's sort of an important target. Um, and we'll talk about how each of the medications sort of influences the, the action potential in the next few slides. Um, so we all know the Vaughn Williams classification for antiarrhythmic drugs. So um, I'll go this briefly, go through this slide briefly, and then uh, go into a little bit more detail by each, about each of these. Uh, so class one drugs are sodium channel blockers. They, uh, as we talked about, they reduce phase zero, the slope of phase zero, and then can decrease the peak of the action potential. Uh, three main types of class one antiarrhythmics. So class one A uh, sort of have a moderate uh, you know, binding and dissociation kinetics. Um, and they uh, can prolong the action potential, prolong uh, acute T in someone's effective refractory period, and some reduction in the phase zero slope. And the examples of class 1A medications are quinidine, procainamide, and disopramide. Um, class 1B uh, sodium channel blockers are sort of, they have rapid kinetics, so they bind on quickly and, and, and dissociate quickly, and so sort of think of them as a weak uh, sodium channel blocker. A uh, very sort of minuscule effect on phase uh, zero slope, um, and they can actually, you know, narrow the QRS, they can uh, narrow the QT interval, reduce uh, uh, the action potential duration and the uh, effect of refractory period. And the medications in this group are lidocaine, mixolotine, and phenytoin. Um, class 1 Cs have much slower uh, and sort of stronger kinetics, you know, in terms of dissociating once they bind. Um, and, and in this class is obviously the one that we probably use more often, especially in AFib, um, and we get a pronounced reduction in the slope of phase zero without much of an effect on the action potential duration or the QT interval. Uh, and that includes uh, flecainide and propafenone. Um, Class two medications are beta blockers. I think we know those uh, very well. So I'll skip ahead to the class three antiarrhythmics, which are primary potassium channel blockers, but some of the medications in this group have uh, you know, multiple class effects. Um, and in, in this group, we really sort of delay phase three repolarization by blocking the potassium channels, that outward current that sort of brings our potential back to resting membrane potential. Uh, and so this leads to a, a prolongation in QT, you know, because of the increase in the action potential duration and the effective refractory period. And uh, in this group, we've got dofetilide, sodalol, uh, amiodarone, dronetarone, and uh, IV ibutilide. Um, and then class four are the calcium channel blockers. So skip ahead, but you know those primarily block the L-type calcium channels, uh, and call it can really reduce sort of auto, uh, automaticity of the SA node and the AV node. Um, so to focus in on the class one antiarrhythmics and, and how they affect the action potential, I alluded to this in the last slide, but basically the class one A's um, have sort of intermediate kinetics in terms of, you know, how they bind and dissociate from the sodium channels. Uh, and, they, and you can get a prolongation of the QRS and a prolongation of the QT with these, with these agents. Uh, the class two, uh, class one B uh, antiarrhythmics uh, have sort of no effect on the, uh, the phase zero slope, but can uh, shorten the uh, QT interval slightly. And this is sort of the, the weakest of the three in terms of sodium, ch sodium channel blockade. Um, and uh, because of, it, of its rapid connects, kinetics and ability to dissociate quickly. Uh, and then uh, the flecainide and propafenone and class 1C agents, you know, they have the most pronounced effect on that phase zero slope uh, and um, not much of an effect on the QT interval. Uh, and very slow kinetics for these, so these tend to be the potent sodium channel blockers uh, that we use. Um, just one slide on the class 1A. So uh, quinidine, you know, historically used in AFib or VT, also used in uh, Brugada syndrome and, and has uh, an effect on the uh, transient outward current um, at the top of the uh, peak of the uh, phase zero to into phase one. Um, it can cause QT prolongation, and with that, there's a risk of torsades, and it's actually not dose-related in quinidine. Uh, its primary metabolism is hepatic uh, through the CYP3A4 uh, pathway, uh, and about 20% of it is cleared renally uh, unchanged in urine. Uh, Brocainamide, you know, we use this in VT storm and AFib, and, and you know, where we sort of learn about it in, 
the first time is in pre-excited tachycardias and WPW. Uh, this metabol metabolism of hepatic is of uh, procainamide is also hepatic, and it gets acetylated to um, N-acetyl procainamide or NAPA. Uh, NAPA is interesting; it's got a class three antiarrhythmic drug effect. So once procainamide gets uh, metabolized to NAPA. There's a, a class three effect uh, that can happen as well. And people who are slow acetylators uh, actually you know, develop more toxicity uh, and a risk of drug-induced lupus uh, with, with more NAPA hanging around. Um, you can, it's a negative inotrope, uh, and it also you know, carries with it a, a risk of prosides primarily through that NAPA you know, class three effect and prolonging the QT uh, because of the, the way it's metabolized. Um, and then disopramide, um, often used in AFib with, uh, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It also has a sort of strong vagolytic effect, and so it's anticholinergic. And in, in people that you sort of think might have vagal AF, basically, you know, nighttime atrial fibrillation, uh, and not see it other times or only during periods of high vagal tone, you could theoretically use uh, disopramide in, in that clinical setting as well. Uh, it is a negative inotrope uh, and sort of reduces contractility, which obviously, you know, you want in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and it also has hepatic uh, metabolism through CYP384. Uh, the class 1B antiarrhythmics, so this is that group of, of uh, drugs that have rapid kinetics and dissociation, sort of weak sodium channel blockers. Um, they can be active and partially depolarized myocardial tissue. So in ischemia, you sort of get a slow rise in, in uh, this, the arresting membrane potential of these cells, uh, and that actually promotes that sodium channel to be in more of an active slash inactive state, which is when, when these drugs bind. Um, and so it can be fairly effective in the clinical setting with ischemia. Uh, we talked about how these drugs shorten the QT without having much of an effect on the QRS. Uh, lidocaine's the sort of first and, and most used example of, of these drugs, uh, mostly used for VT and VF. It's got a very high first pass metabolism through the liver. Uh, at toxic levels, um, you know, you get neurologic side effects. Uh, so you track levels of lidocaine and sort of end stage of that, you can even get seizures with levels high enough. Um, Alpha-1 acid glycoprotein is an acute phase reactant, and we see it go up in the setting of MI, but also other acute illness. And it actually can bind lidocaine and decrease its bioavailability. So really, uh, in situations where there may be an acute phase you know, um, illness or a situation going on, you may find that you need more lidocaine than, than you'd expect uh, uh, to, to get the same clinical effect. Uh, and then in terms of... Uh, you know, what to do. So heart failure and, and shock patients, you actually do need to reduce the dose of lidocaine in those clinical settings and heart failure and shock. Uh, you have a reduced, uh, sorry, a uh, reduced uh, volume of distribution. And so um, you need to uh, sort of adjust for that with the lidocaine. Uh, and then mixilatine, you know, oral sodium channel blocker, most often used as an adjunctive therapy for VT when we add it on to, you know, amiodarone. Uh, and it, it also can possibly block the late sodium channel. So one thing I didn't point out in, in phase three of the action potential is there's a late sodium channel uh, that stays open uh, and can let sodium into the cell uh, and sort of lead to sort of, you know, that the plateau of, of the action potential. And potentially this could be a benefit in, in long QT3 where you sort of have a gain of function, you know, SCNA uh, mutation in the sodium channel. Um, that prolongs the QT. And so if you block that late sodium channel with facilitine, um, you could theoretically treat that. So still need to be a lot of studies on that, but it's a potential therapeutic option in those patients. Um, class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs. So you know, these are our, you know, one of our workhorses uh, or some of our workhorse drugs for atrial fibrillation. Uh, these are the sodium channel blockers with slow association and unblocking kinetics, and which means that they can be fairly potent sodium channel blockers. Um, they have a dose-dependent decrease in intracardiac conduction, so you can uh, slow conduction of the atrial tissue itself. You can slow conduction of the hypertrophy tissue. Uh, you can see prolongation in the PR and the QRS uh, with with um, not much effect on QT. Um, these drugs do exhibit sort of what we call use dependence, and basically at faster heart rates, you block more sodium channels. Uh, and the reason for that is more channels, the sodium channels spend more time in the open or inactivated state. So basically phase zero through uh, phase uh, two, um, when 
when uh, the heart rates are faster. So the more time you spend in the, that open slash inactivated state, you get more block, blocked sodium channels. Uh, and they sort of you know, dissociate when the channel closes, which doesn't really happen until uh, you get back to, or on the way down to the resting membrane potential. Um, and so you have a stronger effect of these medications at faster heart rates. Um, and so you, we'll talk about the drugs individually, but this is why we recommend that people be on some AV nodal rate control while they're on this, so that we don't see sort of the toxic effects of class 1C agents at fast heart rates when someone has AFib or SVT or whatever you're treating uh, with the medication. Um, so mostly used to treat you know, AFib and SVT, as I just mentioned. Uh, you can see these agents used for PVC or VT. Often, uh, it really only want it to be in a structurally normal heart. Uh, we'll talk about why in a second. Um, you really, you know, people who are coming in with conduction disease issues, whether that's AV block, bundle branch block, you sort of want to avoid uh, the class 1C agents as that can sort of exacerbate those conduction abnormalities. Um, and uh, in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy, class 1C agents are, uh, tend to be uh, contraindicated, especially in people with LVH, you know, with its wall thickness greater than 1.4, 1.5 centimeters. Uh, that wall thickness really uh, just leads to increased uh, transmural dispersion of repolarization. Uh, and so it really sort of increases the prorhythmic uh, side effect of, of these medications. Um, it's contraindicated in patients with structural heart disease. Uh, these medications can be a negative inotrope um, and they can be prorhythmic. So, you know, with the slowing of conduction in the atrium, you can slow someone's flutter down enough to let them conduct one-to-one -one through their through their AV node, and, and, and often with a wide QRS uh, because of the effect of, of the 1C agent. So this is an example of, um, of uh, somebody who got uh, flecainide and, and you saw one-to-one -one, you know, wide complex tachycardia, but it ended up being uh, atrial flutter uh, being conducted that way. So when you hear of people talking about class 1C flutters, uh, this is sort of what they're thinking about. Um, and so because of this possibility and the risk of this, you know, we recommend that people be on uh, some sort of AV nodal blocking agent uh, at the same time to prevent this from happening. Um, so the trial that has to be mentioned anytime someone uh, talks about class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs is the CAS trial or the cardiac arrhythmia suppression trial. So this was a study uh, you know, published in 1991, uh, patients with prior MI and ventricular ectopy um, and the, there were some cutoffs for ejection fraction. If the MI was within 90 days, their EF just had to be less than 55. But if the MI was older than 90 days, uh, the EF uh, was less than 40% uh, to get it to the study. And these patients were randomized to either enconide or fluconide. Uh, and their primary endpoint was arrhythmic death of cardiac arrest. And you can see in these, um, these curves that um, people who got the fluconide or, or uh, enconide at a, a much higher rate of, of arrhythmic death or cardiac arrest. And so for this reason, especially, uh, you know, when we talk about fluconide and these agents not being used in, um, in uh, structurally, the structural heart disease, we really, you know, want to be you know, focused on sort of the uh, potential negative effects in people with coronary disease, especially if they've had prior PCI, prior MI. Uh, and it's, it's because of this trial that, that uh, you know, we avoid use of, of 1C agents in, in people with prior uh, coronary disease. Um, appropriate use of, of these agents. So these are agents that can be started as an outpatient, uh, which, you know, patients, you know, if you present them options for antiarrhythmic drugs, you know, one of the uh, things that patients like is it's not coming into the hospital to start a medication. So this, you know, you can do these, uh, you, can, you can start these as an outpatient. Uh, generally recommend that there be some uh, stress testing prior to starting it, just to make sure there's no evidence of, of ischemia or coronary disease. Uh, always get a baseline ECG to assess existing sinus node or uh, AV node conduction abnormalities. Um, we do want to monitor the ECG uh, during the initiation phase as well as for any dose changes. So uh, basically, if you, um, you know, get started on the medication, you get an EKG you know, one to two weeks later, you know, if the QRS duration has increased by 25%, uh, you're supposed to decrease the dose by 50%. Uh, and if that doesn't lead to normalization of the patient's QRS, then you really should be discontinuing the uh, 1C agent, whether it's fluconide or propafenone. Um, 
you do want to stress people uh, after initiation. You want to get their heart rate up and see if, if uh, you see that use-dependent phenomenon of the QRS widening with uh, exercise. Um, these agents can increase uh, a pacing threshold. Uh, so something to look out for if they have a device um, to make sure you're checking on um, the, doing device interrogations and checking capture thresholds. Um, again, we've got to make the point of uh, always having these patients on some sort of AV nodal blockade as well. Uh, and you do want to avoid it in patients with low EF uh, for the risk of, of proarrhythmia, as I mentioned, but also you know, these agents do have negative inotropic effects, so you can sort of potentially worsen heart failure. Uh, and then again, the same uh, comment about severe LVH, um, just because it does increase the risk of proarrhythmia uh, torsades when when your wall is that thick, you know, repolarization can be uh, more heterogeneous and, and sort of you're putting more of the heart in this vulnerable period where you could have you know, early after depolarizations and potentially, you know, induce polymorphic VTVF or torsades. Um, so we, we recommend not using this medication in people with LVH uh, or severe LVH. Um, so we can move on to the class three. So these are the potassium channel blockers. Um, and primarily their effect is, you know, in that phase three, the, the rapid delay uh, rectifier uh, potassium channel. Uh, the effect of blocking the potassium channel here, you know, you're going to sort of uh, prevent potassium from leaving the cell. And so you're keeping the resting membrane potential up higher and that sort of prolongs the duration of phase three. Uh, and so you get a longer QT um, and, and with that a longer effective refractory period. Um, these agents actually exhibit the opposite phenomenon. So we saw use dependence with class one agents. We see reverse use dependence with class three agents. Basically, this means that we're, these agents block more potassium channels at slower heart rates when more time is spent uh, you know, in phase two and three. Um, and so at slower heart rates, the risk of QT prolongation gets even higher uh, and the risk of torsades gets even higher. Uh, and again, for the same reason where you're really spending more time in that vulnerable period uh, where at early after depolarizations can happen and you, you increase the risk of, of polymorphic DT and VF. Um, so I'll start by talking about dofetilide or ticosin, uh, primarily used for atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Uh, no big effects on PR interval, QRS, or HV conduction, and a minimal effect on the heart rate. You know, big studies generally have shown you know, less than a five beat per minute decrease in, in you know, sinus rates uh, in people with, uh, who get ticosin. Uh, you do need to be in, uh, admitted as an inpatient for drug initiation um, because of the risk of, of torsades and QT prolongation. Um, and in general, we do not start uh, dofetilide on patients with a baseline corrected QT interval greater than 440 milliseconds, or if they're coming in with some conduction abnormalities um, for, uh, you know, QTs greater than 500 milliseconds, uh, we wouldn't start dofetilide. Um, the metabolism is 80% renal, and so we really need to dose adjust for, for creatinine clearance uh, in patients that you're starting uh, on dofetilide. Uh, if you're not doing that, you're really just inc you know, significantly increasing uh, a person's risk of, of torsades and, and uh, polymorphic VT slash VEF. Um, no major effect of dofetilide on the myocardial contractility and no major effect on a, a patient's defibrillation threshold. This medication is safe in heart failure and in the post-MI setting, uh, and that was shown uh, in a uh, two parallel studies known as the Diamond studies. So there was Diamond CHF and Diamond MI. Uh, and in both uh, studies, we had about 1,500 patients. And just looking at survival in patients with uh, congestive heart failure randomized to either dofetilide or placebo. In the uh, CHF uh, study, they were not allowed to have an MI within seven days uh, of, the, of being enrolled. Um, whereas the MI study, you know, they, the MI had, had happened recently within the last seven days prior uh, to initiation. And these patients were given dofetilide regardless you know, of whether they were having a fib or arrhythmia or whatever. They were just looking at survival uh, with an antiarrhythmic. And so what they found uh, is that in congestive heart failure and in the setting of recent myocardial infarction, um, real, really no major difference between dofetilide and placebo uh, in terms of survival. Um, and so that, you know, was 
much different than the CAST study, right? So I think, um, you know, in, when we compare to fetalide to class 1C agents, you know, much safer in these two clinical scenarios. So um, and you'd be more willing to use use it in a patient with coronary disease or, or uh, structural heart disease. Um, the sort of other thing they found in the diamond study is that it's a pretty good antiarrhythmic. So within that group of patients that got the medication, they looked at you know who had a fib and who actually converted to sinus rhythm while uh, during the study period, and then and then if they did convert to sinus rhythm, they sort of looked at what was the patient's probability of staying in sinus rhythm in the two groups. And you could see you know dofetilide, um, you know patients had a significantly higher likelihood of staying in sinus rhythm if they had a fib and converted on dofetilide. Uh, to begin with compared to placebo. Uh, so pretty good, you know, at two, you know, three years out here, um, you know, we're seeing 60% you know, uh, likelihood of staying in sinus rhythm in those patients. So um, those were two uh, positive studies for Defetalide. Um, so some drug interactions to be aware of. Um, so really, you know, you know, the ones that come up in our cardiology world, obviously, are uh, verapamil and hydrochlorothiazide. So verapamil increases the absorption of dofetilide uh, as it leads to increased intestinal blood flow. And so that sort of leads to the dofetilide absorption increase. So definitely, um, you know, you could, you know, with more dofetilide, the higher the risk of proarrhythmia. And so uh, it's contraindicated to be on verapamil with uh, ticosin. And then hydrochlorothiazide uh, inhibits the renal excretion of dofetilide. And so that also increases to unacceptably, or leads to unacceptably high levels of, of dofetilide. And so that's contraindicated. Uh, and then any CYP3A4 uh, inhibitors, which the list is long, uh, can lead to elevated ticosin levels. Uh, and then cimetidine is another one uh, you wouldn't always think of, but it, it does inhibit uh, the renal excretion of dofetilide, so it increases dofetilide levels as well. So those are some important medications to be aware of, uh, interactions to be aware of. I think on my EP boards, I got at least two, maybe three questions uh, about uh, verapamil and dofetilide and, and being able to recognize that that uh, is not a good combination and that you shouldn't have uh, someone on both. Um, so it's an important one that comes up clinically, uh, as we see a lot of patients with hypertension, right? Uh, but also uh, in, the, in, in preparing for boards, that'll be an important one to remember. Um, so I'll move on to SOTOL also. Also, you know, it's indicated for AFib. Uh, we can also see it used in the treatment of VT or PVCs or VF. Uh, SOTOL, it's got a beta blocking action in, in addition to being a class three antiarrhythmic. So it does uh, cause some negative inotropy. So you want to sort of avoid the use uh, of this in, in patients with heart failure. Um, this medication also requires an inpatient admission for initiation. Um, and it, it carries with it, and the, that's because it carries with it a risk of torsades with the risk of QT prolongation. 60% of the uh, torsades events happen in the first three days on the medication, and 75% happen within, within seven days of being on the medication. Um, we talked about the negative inotropy and, and leading to a uh, risk of worsening heart failure. Uh, and it's predominantly renally excreted. So again, another medication that we really have to uh, carefully dose based on someone's creatinine clearance uh, to, to reduce uh, the risk of proarrhythmia. Um, and then there's, there's dronetarone, so also known as Maltac. So this is another class three agent most used mostly for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Uh, could be used for persistent AFib, but you really need a plan to restore sinus rhythm with a cardioversion if you're going to be doing that. Uh, and I'll show you why uh, with, a, with an interesting study in, in the next few slides. Um, multiple ion channel effects, uh, not just class three, but you know it's got more more class effects than that. Uh, Dronetarone, as, as we all know, lacks an iodine moiety, and so the risk of adverse side effects that you see with amiodarone are a lot less with, with dronetarone. Um, uh, it reaches steady state at about seven days of use, uh, and its sort of important contraindications are in patients with recently decompensated heart failure, in patients with uh, class four New York Heart Association heart failure, and in people with longstanding persistent AFib, there's no plan to restore sinus rhythm. So essentially, people that you know have met with their doctor or met with their electrophysiologist and, and have decided to stay in AFib, um, permanently, there's really, uh, it's contraindicated to be on dronetarone uh, due to an increased risk. Um, some of the important dronetarone trials, so there was the Athena trial. This was 
a little bit more than 4,600 patients and in, in patients uh, with paroxysmal or persistent AFib. Uh, and the major inclusion criteria were that they were either older than 75 or if they were between 70 and 74, they had one risk factor. So either hypertension, stroke, or prior TIA, diabetes, uh, dilated left atrium or low EF. Uh, and they found that uh, being on dronetarone uh, reduced your time to first uh, CV hospitalization or death from any cause as a combined endpoint. Uh, that that benefit was primarily driven by decreased hospitalizations, as you see in the chart. Um, and uh, to be honest, I know the risk factors here are listed. The you know most, of, by and large, most of these patients were paroxysmal, so uh, I wouldn't necessarily you know uh, jump to putting this on for everyone with persistent AFib. Um, and uh, very few patients actually had an EF less than forty in, in the whole study group. Um, but you know, this was sort of one of the positive trials for dronetarone. Um, and then we'll talk about a couple of negative trials. So there was Andromeda, uh, which looked at hospitalized patients with class three, class four heart failure uh, within the last month. Um, and they also had uh, what they documented as a low wall function score, but essentially equated to ejection fraction less than around 35% or less. Um, looked at about 600 patients in this trial was stopped prematurely uh, because the incidence of uh, the primary endpoint, which was all-cause mortality, was, as you can see in the chart, uh, you know, much higher in the dronetarone group. And so because of this study, you know, we, it is now contraindicated to have patients on dronetarone uh, with class three or four heart failure, uh, especially in patients that have had a decompensated heart failure episode in the last four weeks. Um, and if, if they've got depressed LV function, then even more, more of a reason not to be beyond your heterone. Um, the, another negative trial for dronetarone was the PALACE trial. So this was a trial done 3,200 patients, uh, all 65 years or older. Uh, and then they this is a group of people that had sort of six months of you know, long-standing persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation before being into the you know, randomized in the trial to either dronetarone or placebo. And you can see in this group, dronetarone increased the combined endpoint, which included stroke, MI, uh, systemic embolism, cardiovascular death, uh, or hospitalization uh, by a significant amount. This trial was also stopped prematurely. Um, and, uh, and this is the reason that we, you know, it's contraindicated to put somebody on dronetarone uh, if you're not planning to restore sinus rhythm, the, the risk of the all of these, uh, you know, major endpoints is just much too high, probably from a proarrhythmia standpoint. Um, some important drug-drug interactions for dronetarone, uh, verapamil and diltiazem uh, can increase dronetarone levels due to their inhibition of CYP384. Uh, dronetarone itself can actually inhibit uh, CYP2D6, which is a major uh, metabolizing, you know, pathway for beta blockers. So through that inhibition, beta blocker levels can be increased uh, just by being on dronetarone. Uh, dronetarone is also a P glycoprotein inhibitor uh, and an important uh, medication that we sometimes come in contact with. Obviously, it's Pradaxa or Dabigatran, uh, and that is metabolized through the P glycoprotein uh, pathway. And so, dronetarone can, can lead to elevated levels of, of Pradaxa. Uh, there's a risk of bradycardia and QT prolongation when patients are on dronetarone and uh, rare cases of severe liver injury or liver failure either. Uh, and then we'll move on to amiodarone. So, you know, class three, but really has multiple, multiple class effects. So class one, two, and four antirhythmic effects uh, used in atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia, and we see it in BT. It's very lipophilic. Uh, it achieves its steady state in about two to four weeks. The terminal half-life, or basically the half-life for, you know, from whatever plasma level it is to 50% of that is a long time. So it's about 50 days. So it sticks around uh, in the system for a while. Um, the metabolism is, is uh, hepatic through the CYP384 um, mechanism and really negligible renal excretion for amiodarone. It's very well tolerated in patients with heart failure and very low risk of proarrhythmia. So it sounds like the perfect drug, right? Uh, compared to what I've been telling you up until now. Um, but it does have its own toxicities, which we'll get into detail a little bit uh, in, a few, in a couple slides here. Um, 
we, you know, the adverse effects of amiodarone that you want to think about. So bradycardia, really rare torsades. Uh, you can see elevated LFTs. Generally, it's a mild increase, uh, but if the LFTs rise more than three times the upper limit of normal, you do want to decrease the dose or just discontinue, uh, especially if it's above that three three times the upper limit of normal range. Uh, other side effects can be rash, GI distress, and headaches. Uh, when it's given as an IV bolus, uh, you want to be careful about hypotension. Uh, and monitoring people's blood pressures um, in that sort of acute rhythm control setting that you're giving it in. Uh, and then lots of drug interactions with amiodarone, but the two that I wanted to highlight, um, digoxin, you want to decrease the digoxin dose by 50% because amiodarone is also a peak glycoprotein inhibitor and digoxin uh, works through that pathway or gets metabolized through that pathway. And then for warfarin, you also want to decrease the dose uh, by 30 to 50 percent because amiodarone inhibits the CYP2C9 uh, pathway through which warfarin gets metabolized. Um, we'll talk about thyroid toxicity. So amiodarone contains 37 percent iodine by weight. Um, basically a 200 milligram dose of amiodarone includes 75 milligrams of organic iodine. Uh, and the subsequent deiodination process releases about six milligrams of free circulating iodine per day. Um, and that's about 20 to 40 times higher than the average daily iodine intake uh, in the US. Um, so significant iodine load, um, and it can lead to thyroid toxicities because of that load. Uh, we can see hypothyroidism through the sort of wolf checkoff effect, essentially uh, elevated levels of thyroid in the, in the bloodstream and the plasma can uh, sort of lead to blocking of the thyroid's ability to successfully uptake iodine. Uh, and so it uh, can reduce thyroid hormone biosynthesis. Amiodarone at the peripheral level and the peripheral tissue can also inhibit T4 to T3 conversion. So that's another way that hypothyroidism uh, uh, can happen with amiodarone. The incidence of hypothyroidism is somewhere between 6 and 13%. Uh, you make the diagnosis by noting an increased TSH and a low free T4. Uh, and the treatment for this is uh, either to stop the amiodarone, or if you have to be on the amiodarone, you can uh, you can try giving exogenous uh, thyroid hormone or, or synthroid. We can also see hyperthyroidism uh, with with amiodarone. Uh, the incidence of thyroid toxicosis is two to twelve percent, and uh, it's found to be higher in in regions where where people are iodine deficient. Um, there are two types of thyroid toxicosis. Type 1, uh, essentially, it really happens in people with prior thyroid disease if they've got nodular goiter or Graves' disease, and often can be a very prolonged course. Uh, and, and the iodine load itself actually leads to accelerated thyroid hormone synthesis in these patients. Uh, and if you did a radioactive iodine uptake study, uh, you'd find that the uptake is either normal or increased in this group. Uh, in people uh, with type 2 thyroid toxicosis, you get follicle, uh, follicle cytotoxicity with in inflammation, it's often transient, and, and these patients can be steroid responsive. Uh, you often see elevated inflammatory markers in this condition and elevated thyroglobulin. Uh, and if you did a thyroid uptake study, which sometimes you, you need to differentiate between type 1 and type 2, uh, you would actually find that the uptake is low or absent in people with type 2 uh, thyroid toxicosis. Uh, the treatment for these uh, can, it's a wide range, can be just amiodarone withdrawal. You sometimes need, you know, um, you know medications to support the thyroid toxicosis, things like methimazole or PTU. And then in some patients, they even need surgical uh, therapy if, if uh, the thyroid toxicosis doesn't uh, resolve. Um, there's pulmonary toxicity, uh, low incidence, but, but can happen, you know, 0.5 to 2% in the first year. Uh, and after that, 0.5 to 1% per year uh, rate of pulmonary toxicity. Uh, sort of different forms of pulmonary toxicity in the acute form. You can see acute respiratory distress syndrome, hypersensitivity, and pneumonitis. Uh, in this clinical setting, uh, patients can be steroid responsive. Uh, in subacute pulmonary toxicity, um, sort of the clinical features of that are fever and acute dyspnea. Uh, and in the chronic form, it's really an insidious dyspnea. Um, non-productive cough, uh, you can see interstitial pneumonitis, you can see pulmonary fibrosis on imaging. Um, things to, you know, consider is, is x-ray, you know, when you look at that, you see diffuse interstitial or, or alveolar infiltrates, uh, and PFTs uh, in these patients show decreased uh, diffusion capacity. Uh, and there's an example of, of an x-ray with those uh, infiltrates bilaterally and CT next to it as well.
Um, other toxicities, there's ocular toxicity. Halo vision is very common. That's a very normal side effect that people get with amiodarone. Uh, the more concerning ocular toxicity is if people start to get gradual bilateral vision loss, and that's thought to be to, due to uh, amiodarone-induced optic neuritis. Um, so obviously, patients on amiodarone long-term really need to be followed by an ophthalmologist long-term as well to look for this. Uh, and then there's neurologic toxicities, side effects of tremor, ataxia, uh, gait disturbance. Um, you can get proximal muscle weakness from, from amiodarone, as well as peripheral neuropathy. So wide range of toxicities uh, for amiodarone, especially with, with long-term use. Uh, and then just one quick slide on ibutilide. Um, this is an IV medication used for acute pharmacologic cardioversion for AFib or flutter. Uh, the risk of torsades uh, with ibutilide is somewhere between 2 to 4%, depending on what studies you look at. Uh, Pre-treating a patient with magnesium, if you're about to give them uh, ibutilide, does reduce the risk of torsades. Um, and it also, you know, if you're going to, you know, the time where I see this most often is in the setting of, of cardioversion and trying to improve your rate of cardioversion. And so if you treat people with ibutilide before a cardioversion, it actually does improve their their likelihood of convergent to sinus rhythm. Uh, when you give it, you really need to keep patients uh, for four hours of monitoring after administration with an ECG or EKG every hour, uh, just to keep a very close eye on their QT interval, as this is a class three agent as well. Uh, and the way it's administered is a one milligram infusion over 10 minutes uh, for patients that weigh greater than 60 kilograms. For patients that weigh less than 60 kilograms, it's weight-based dosing, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, and so this is the last slide. So just a, a general sort of framework. This is taken from the 2014 um, guidelines for the management of AFib from the AHA, ACC, and Heart Rhythm Society. Um, and uh, you know, sort of start thinking about patients in, with AFib. Do they have structural heart disease? Do they are they do they have a structurally normal heart? And what your options are. Um, and you can see that in the, in the group with no structural heart disease, you've got more options. You can think about the class 1C agents, um, as long as you're also having them on AP nodal rate control. Um, even in these patients, always keep an eye out for LVH and, and look at an echo and, and be sure that they, their uh, uh, wall thickness isn't greater than 1.5 centimeters as that increases uh, the risk of uh, Torsades, and that's what this little symbol, the, uh, the S symbol here, is that for uh, really keeping an eye on the LVH for flecainide, propafenone, sotalol, or dofetilide. Um, and then if you're at an experienced center and the patient prefers it, um, you can take someone straight to catheter ablation, but most often uh, we go through a process of uh, trying an antiarrhythmic medication first. Uh, and then you can see on the structural heart disease, um, half of this figure, uh, patients with heart failure, your options are very limited. Really, the, the studies suggest that amiodarone and defetilide are really the only medications that should be considered in that setting uh, based on the, some of the trials that I talked about. Um, and in patients with coronary disease, obviously, you're not going to see class 1C agents recommended due to the CAS trial. Uh, you could think about defetilide, sotalol, and phenetarone in that group. Um, uh, and, uh, and then amiodarone, obviously, you know, is... Uh, can be used for either of these situations with uh, as long as there's a close eye kept on possible toxicities and uh, determining how long of course you really need for, for patients. Uh, so I think that is um, the majority of the talk. I know uh, antiarrhythmic drugs is a much bigger topic than that, but I tried to sort of hit the highlights uh, and the important things to know. Great. Thanks, Tubi. That was great. As yeah. you said, um, clinically extremely important for all of us and then very important for the boards. Um, maybe I'll just ask you a couple questions. Sure. One is um, the use of class 1Cs for uh, PVC-induced cardiomyopathy. You know, normally we avoid uh, 1C agents with cardiomyopathy, but they also work very well for uh, PVC suppression. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there obviously it's, a very, it's an area with very little data, um, but I do, um, you know, there's a group, you know, the Penn group published this paper um, uh, a couple of years ago, where they really just looked retrospectively at a big population of patients that got 1C agents and only came up with 20 total, 20 patients that got class 1C agents. Um, and uh, they found that you can uh, really, you know, effectively treat someone's PVCs. So basically, 
you can see that someone's pre 1C agent PVC burn was 36% on average and they got it down to 10%. Uh, and it was uh, almost all patients had benefit there. Um, and, uh, and their EF can also improve. And it's only 20 patients, so not you know, a large group. Interestingly, you know, you, about 20% of the patients had an ICD, so not all of them were protected. So you know, you, it can be safe in, in, in these patients, even though their EF's low, uh, if you're fairly confident that it's PPC driven and not some other uh, structural problem, I think it's a reasonable uh, option for these patients, but it really hasn't entered our guidelines yet, but it, it can be very effective. Um, and interestingly, in I think seven of these 20 patients, they actually had delayed enhancement on cardiac MRI. So maybe you wouldn't necessarily call them totally structurally normal. Um, they did comment in this paper that that delayed enhancement in all seven patients was less than, the burden of delayed enhancement was less than 5% or less than 5% scar. Um, so it wasn't a, you know, a lot of delayed enhancement, but even in those patients, that's what C and D are here, that you can drop someone's PVC burden uh, significantly and increase their, their EF. So uh, it can definitely be considered and, and potentially an option. Uh, especially if the patient's uh, a little reluctant to go to straight to ablation. I think it's, a, it's something you can offer. And then another question, you know, that slide you showed us from the AFib guideline says not to use basically any antiarrhythmic except dronetarone or amiodarone if the um, wall thickness is greater than one and a half, which would obviously make treating HCM patients quite difficult. So yeah. any thoughts on other antiarrhythmics for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Yeah, so I briefly talked at the beginning about, um, you know, this thought that you could use disoparide with its negative contractility effect, um, and especially in people with vagal AFib. Um, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that same paper here on the left has, has a few guidelines. They say, you know, in this class 2A window that antiarrhythmic medications can be useful to prevent recurrent AFib. Uh, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and the two they mentioned were amiodarone and disopramide. Uh, and then um, also in the in the category, so less less of a strong recommendation, but in 2B, they talked about sotalol, dofetilide, and dronetarone as being possibly considered with a you know, level of evidence of C, so just expert consensus. But I did see this abstract in 2017, so three years after these guidelines, uh, that a group of people res retrospectively looked at almost 100 patients with HCM and what antiarrhythmics they got and were they safe and you know how long did they stay on it and in general it seemed like uh, sotalol probably won out there you know uh, they had the highest sort of retention rate also combined with the least uh, people sort of stopping therapy due to inefficacy and you know minimal sort of safety events um, and uh, and I think their sort of abstract I don't think it was published sort of suggested that sotalol may be just as effective and and uh, may be okay in people with, with HCM. Uh, I guess possibly maybe due to the beta blocking effect of sotalol, and that obviously is an important part of HCM therapy too. So I think the data still needs to be really fleshed out for that group, but um, I think uh, there are options in, in, in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, and I would say probably either sotalol or, or um, disopramide as a starting point. Okay, great. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to unmute. Otherwise, I'm going to say thank yeah, you. Got just, just one for you, gentlemen. Okay. Regarding uh, uh, the uh, quinidine and brugada, so this is really uh, an EP where, where we need an EP specialist to help us. The, um, you presented a slide early on saying that, that quinidine could be used for brugada syndrome therapeutically, but it isn't it also sometimes used in the invasive EP lab to induce uh, uh, Brugada in pe people where it's suspected? Uh, so could you comment on that, how, how it's used in both settings? Or am I, am I misremembering something? Yeah, well, I'm not sure about using quinidine for um, sort of Brugada testing. We often do a procainamide challenge or adjmaline challenge. Um, which can sort of bring out the Brugada pattern. Uh, with quinidine, you know, the sort of thought as to why it's effective in Brugada is, um, let me pull up the action potential figure, um, is a, uh, a blocking of this transient outward current. So it's not necessarily through its sodium channel effects, um, but by blocking, uh, you know, these, these outward uh, currents, it, you know, has some effect in reducing sort of the, the transmural heterogeneity that people see in Brugada syndrome. Uh, 
especially in sort of the uh, the RVOT uh, area, and it tends to to you know, suppress arrhythmias in, in that patient uh, in, in those that it works. But uh, I don't know, Nishai, have you seen people use quinidine for challenging uh, in Brugada? No, as you said, normally procainamide in the lab. Yeah. And, and so, you know, thanks for that clarification. And so since they're both 1A drugs, how do you account for the difference in that regard <laughs> between yeah. the quinidine and the procainamide? Well, the 1A just refers to the sodium channel effects, right? I think uh, the, the difference with quinidine is it also has effects on this transient outward current, uh, which procainamide does not. Thanks. Mm -hmm.